All right. So bell ringer for today. Where are we at here? There you go. So describe the op what Operation Dynamo was. Detail the significance of the Battle of Dunkirk. Okay. There we go. Let you guys jot that down, work on that. And how about I give you three to four minutes? Does that work? Sounds good. Three to four minutes. Serene, what kind of candy do you have today? Oh, it's gum. Oh, okay. That was candy. Hey, Kara. Just working on the bell ringer. Just working on the bell ringer, Kiara. Do you have a pug? Do you have a pug? No? You just like the shirt? Nice. Nice. You ever see the movie The Campaign with Will Ferrell? Zach Galifianakis? No, oh, he has pugs. Zach Galifianakis. In it. The guy from Hangover. The guy with a beard? Yeah, here. <clears throat> yeah, how about I give you two more minutes to finish up here? the chiropractor. Okay, so let's get started with this. All right, we went over, okay, obviously the start of World War II, the invasion of Poland, that non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. And then we talked about where Hitler went to first, okay, after that, when he knew the Eastern Front, there was not going to be any type of war on that side just yet, all right, where he can just focus all of his attention on the Western Front against Great Britain and France. So where do you go to next? So once he had Poland already taken care of, where do you go to, Troy? Do you remember? Denmark. Yeah, Denmark. Good job, right? So then he can have, you know, establish, you know, he can grab resources, establish Laban's realm, and uh, he can start creating a stronger navy to combat against Great Britain out in the open seas in the North Sea, you know, eventually maybe the Atlantic Ocean. And then we talked about how it went to Norway, okay, for resources, iron, okay, especially for iron, to help fuel his industries to create a larger war machine. And Laban's realm, right? And to establish uh, naval bases there to really try to put the pressure on Great Britain. So we know Great Britain being that island, 
okay, out in the out in the Atlantic Ocean in the North Sea there. So uh, Germany really wanted to take it to them. And we know with the Treaty of Versailles, Great Britain's wrinkle that they threw in there, let's take Germany's navy away from them. Okay, so it looks like Hitler's really getting back at them. Okay. And then we talked about how Hitler then invaded some of these countries here, with Belgium, Netherlands, moving closer and closer to France. Okay. And in a part of northern France, with this invasion of France, they stop at a beach of Dunkirk, right? So who wants to describe the battle of Dunkirk? What happened there? Was it really much of a battle? Jeffrey, no, describe it for him, man. There's about 40,000 British troops were stranded there with no doubt, and Germany just stopped it. More than that, man. How many troops? 400,000. Okay, all right, there you go. Yeah, I thought you said 40,000. Yeah, so 400,000 around. Okay, so French and British troops. And what happened? They were stranded there, no way to get anywhere. Germany started attacking, then they stopped. So they did Operation Dynamo, which was British civilians using their own boats to go rescue the troops. Yeah, good job. So we all know that Great Britain, okay, to try to help benefit France before they get totally invaded by Germany, they started sending troops over the English Channel. You know the English Channel right here, okay? And uh, as they're doing that, they're kind of caught off guard because they didn't really expect Germany to advance as quick as they did. And what tactic was that again that Germany used? Troy? Yeah, Blitzkrieg. Lighting warfare. All right, good. So then that led to Dunkirk. And all these troops are standing on the beach. They just were amazed how quick and fast uh, the Nazi aggression okay, happened. All right, and they're just like standing there. Well, what do we do? Oh, my gosh, what do we do? So then uh, there's about 4,000 troops there. And what does Hitler do? Does he continue to maybe attack these soldiers on the beach? Jeffrey? Yeah, he kind of stops, right? He kind of stops. And the Luftwaffe, yeah, they kind of maybe continue to attack, drop some bombs, but there wasn't a full-out effect, a full-out you know, entanglement there at Dunkirk. It's almost like the Nazis just kind of stopped. Hitler stopped his power, stopped his aggression right there at Dunkirk. And why did he stop? What was the reason for that? Train, go ahead. Yeah, good job, right? So he's like, okay, we're expanding at an alarming rate. Uh, this is very successful. This is great, okay? But at the same time, we need to make sure that we can try to establish our supply lines, uh, maybe just focus on uh, really fortifying those uh, supply lines to make sure we can continue to fight and capture the real, you know, uh, real opposition with France to make sure that we're fully fully loaded here. So he slows down, he stops, okay? But yeah, the Luftwaffe, there's still kind of, uh, there's still kind of dogfights, I guess you could say, up in the airs with the RAF, the Royal Air Force, okay, and the Luftwaffe, they're dropping some bombs there on the beachhead. But I guess you could say this term was coined, sitting ducks, because that's what all these troops were. Around 400,000 troops just sitting on the beachhead waiting for their, for their eventual death, okay? There was nowhere to turn, nowhere to hide. It's like they're just sitting there waiting. And uh, we know Chamberlain, after the Scandinavian countries went down, uh, he left. Uh, who filled his spot as Prime Minister of England, Great Britain? Troy? Winston Churchill. Yeah, Winston Churchill. Good job. And uh, he created this idea, well, he created this term, the, uh, this operation, Dynamo, where the citizens of Great Britain would use their own vessels, use their own boats, their own ships to go and try to save these soldiers off this beach in northern France. Okay, we need to try to evacuate. We need to try to retreat. It's the only way we can maybe continue to keep fighting. Right? Yeah, you can't win wars retreating. You can't win wars evacuating, leaving, especially mainland Europe. But in some cases, this was viewed as a, as a uh, win for Great Britain and the Allies. Why? Why was this a win? Oh, this is maybe a victory, a potential victory, I guess you could say, even though they're retreating. Griffin? Yeah, good job. Good job. So at the start of this war, Great Britain didn't have a strong military, really. Okay. Uh, they were still kind of licking their wounds, wounds from uh, World War I. And they saw the advancement of Germany. They just were like, well, there's really no hope. Okay. After this operation, this kind of showed the army, showed Great Britain and France for a bit. Um, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, motivation, what kind
kind of confidence these people have, their citizens in their army, and uh, that they will never surrender to Germany, okay, that they will never give up. All right. What was some drawbacks, though, with Dunkirk? It wasn't all very, you know, obviously they didn't really win that battle, Great Britain of Dunkirk. Uh, yeah, they retreated. Yeah, they evacuated. But what else? What else do you think maybe is a drawback or a loss for them at Dunkirk? So yeah, they're kind of giving up, you know, their stance in uh, you know continental Europe. Right? But what else is a loss? What do you think, Jeffrey? What do you think, buddy? They lost quite a few troops due to not being able to get there fast enough. Okay, yeah. So yeah, quite a few troops, right? Especially with the bombing runs by the Luftwaffe. What else though? Jeffrey? Germany would eventually go on to take France. Okay, which we're going to talk about today. All right. So, yeah, they didn't really have a force there to try to stop Germany from advancing into France, into Paris. Or what are you going to say? Uh, they possibly have the target now because they were the back Okay, yeah, right? Especially to the United States. It's like, what, what, the, what the heck's going on over there? It's like, you guys are retreating. All right. Uh, Germany's really going to take all of pretty much. Continental Europe. What else, though? So we know with these British passenger ships, these uh, civilian ships, are they as large as destroyers, as large as these battleships that they have? So do you think they have the ability to transport all the weapons, all the supplies that they dropped off on the beach? No, they did. So they just kind of left, left it there. All their rifles, all their equipment, all their supplies that was dropped off, just abandoned it. we got to get out of here. we got to go. Okay, if not... The Nazis are just going to pick us apart here on the beachhead. So, yeah, in, in a way, you know, we, we all know it's kind of a loss because they retreated. They left. They left a lot of armaments and supplies there on the beach. You know, some thousands of troops died as well. But uh, for the most part, this was a win in a way for Great Britain because they uh, it showed the pride that these British civilians, citizens have for their army. All right. Is there any questions on Dunkirk? So that's in part of northern France. Okay, I don't know if I detailed that enough. It's right along the English Channel. So we see Germany actually pushing into France more and more, which we're going to talk more about today. All right. Vocab terms for today. Vocab terms for today. There it is. So I don't know if you wrote those down, uh, that one term down yesterday, the RAF, the Royal Air Force, but maybe you should put that in, okay? So if you want to, well, actually, please do, the RAF. I'll write that up here, then. I'll add that. So that kind of goes along with you, Basil, and Dunkirk, the RAF. That's just the Royal Air Force, Great Britain's Air Force. <clears throat> All right, there you go. Well, we'll talk about the RAF a little bit more when we get to the Battle of Britain and uh, maybe some of the issues and you know, maybe some of the dogfights that are going to be happening as Germany might try to invade Great Britain. All right, so RAF, that's, uh, that went along with uh, yesterday's lesson. And then today we're going to talk about Germany's invasion of France, 1940, the Franco-German armistice in 1940, <clears throat> the wagon of Champion, I think that's how you describe it, I think that's how you say it, and then Marshal Patton. So just looking at the vocab, you can kind of see where this is going to lead to, where this is going to go. Right. We kinda we kinda understand you know Hitler's next target. And really, just if you look at the years of the invasion of the armistice, it doesn't last too long. Okay. So I'll let you guys work on that a couple minutes. We'll go over them. And that'll be it. Oh, I got a couple pictures to show you too. That's about it.
I'll give you one more minute to finish up here and we'll talk about these terms and <clears throat> I'll show you some pictures as we go through them. All right, so we'll go over this a while. So the RAF, we know, as the Royal Air Force. We're not going to focus on that too much. I'll talk about them a little bit more probably tomorrow, okay, with Battle of Britain because they're, they're very, very significant in that battle there. But uh, Germany's invasion of France, 1940. What do we have here for this? What do you got, buddy? I'm also known as the Battle of France, the invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Avalon. Yeah, good job. Good job. So we already know kind of the, the uh, alliances there that were established after that invasion of Poland. And we talked why Hitler kind of went through these countries of, you know, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, just because we know that marginal line there, the France, you know, the Franco-German border, is really heavily defended. So it's like, well, we'll just march through these other countries like we did in World War I. Same way. Okay. We'll just use this new tactic, Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare, to do it. And uh, they all know that France really wasn't, I guess, ready for this. It was like almost like a surprise for them. Okay. And I guess that, that's what you can say for Hitler's idea and plan of not really trying to crush those troops that were stranded on Dunkirk. He was more focused with Paris. Okay. Paris, France. Right. This was something that Germany was trying to accomplish for, heck, almost 80 years. Right. Since 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, right? we know, uh, you know Prussia becoming a dominant power. They unified Germany with this war, and uh, they didn't capture France. They kind of hauled it. They stopped. Then with World War I, okay, Germany didn't have the ability to take Paris, France. They fell short. Okay? But Hitler comes in, in power after that Treaty of Versailles, okay? especially with what France was doing to them and Great Britain, but mostly France. France was the clear country, the power that wanted to take away their military, take away their borders, take away their territories, make them pay these reparations. So for Hitler, this was almost like a revenge tour, right? A revenge tour. This is something that he wanted to try to accomplish. This was one of his main goals was to try to take over France. Um, since Germany was unified, they haven't done so. They failed to do so. Okay, I guess you could say in the Franco-Prussian War they could have, but they just kind of stopped. But <clears throat> that being said, Hitler wanted revenge. And if you want to write that down with the Battle of Dunkirk, maybe that's why he stopped. Maybe that's why he halted his advancement on that beachhead. It's like, you know what? Why risk the resources? Why risk the, uh, you know, the troops fighting on that beachhead? when maybe we could just take over Paris, France. Maybe we can take over this country that tried to really stick it to us and stab us you know, when we were already down, okay, and kick dirt in her face when we were already down at the end of World War I. Right, so this was really just kind of revenge for Hitler. So this invasion of France, right, with Dunkirk, that's not too far away from Paris. Dunkirk's right up here at the top of France, very close to where Belgium's at, that border. And Paris... Heck, it's not too far away. So you can see the advancement already and see how fast these troops are moving and fast these, uh, you know, how, how, how quick Germany's moving through this short period of time. And we know France was really loaded up at that border, okay, with that Maginot line. And so this invasion didn't take too long. Germany took over France pretty quick. It was actually only around 35 days. It wasn't too long. 
Okay, it wasn't too long. And why? Because France really wasn't able to compete with this military tactic of Blitzkrieg. Uh, they saw their advancement already with Poland, moving into the Scandinavian countries. Okay, and then with these countries of Luxembourg, Belgium, and Netherlands, they couldn't really stop them. So within a, a few 35 days, heck, a little bit over a month, right, Hitler takes over France. Okay, he takes over Paris. Right? So this country is kind of divided, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, tomorrow. But uh, he takes over Paris, and he's really trying to throw salt in the wound here. Okay, he's trying to show France and the rest of the world that you know uh, he's seeking his revenge, and he's angry about it. He's uh, confident with his ability, and we'll talk about how, in a way, he's kind of happy with what went down there. All right, so that leads into Franco-German armistice 1940. What do we have here for this? What do we have for this, this, this term? What do you got, Troy? Yeah, good job. So it kind of divides it almost right down the middle here. Right, right down the middle, and uh, the northern part of France, Paris, the capital, is taken over and controlled by Germany. Right? And it's interesting, this armistice is actually signed the next term. What is that, Serene? Compiègne, I believe. That's fine. What is that? Describe it to everybody. Uh, it was around and the committee was signed in. Um, there's also the wagon that was used in 1918 to the end of World War I. Yeah, good job, good job. So this wagon, this uh, it was really just a train car, okay? And uh, this was like a, a, a historical, I guess you say almost like a monument for France and for the Allied powers. This is where the treaty, well, I guess you could say the armistice was signed at the end of World War I. And it just showed and expressed in uh, many of the kind of artifacts around that this was the end of the German Empire. This took it out. This took it away. Okay. And this armistice that was signed at the end of World War I was actually signed in this rail car. So what do you think Hitler's going to do when he takes over France, when he, when he takes over Paris? What do you think he does, Lentz? To really throw salt in the think he, Where do you think he signs the armistice in 1940? When Germany takes him over in that rail car. Oh my gosh. He's like, you know what? We're really going to stick it to him. We're going to sign this armistice. We're going to have them surrender in the exact rail car that we surrendered to them in World War I. Oh my gosh. What do you think the German people are thinking at this time? They're jacked up. They're jacked up, right? So after this is signed in this wagon of champion, okay, this rail car. He goes home to a victor's salute, right? There's parades all over Germany. People are screaming, yelling, and uh, really just praising Hitler for what he accomplished in a short period of time where he was the supreme leader. So we talked about it. What did Hitler promise the people when he came into power? So we all know the, the higher standard of living. He's going to rebuild the military. He's going to take the lands that they lost in World War I. And now... He's seeking revenge on these countries that really torn him apart at the end of World War I. So, how do you think German nationalism is right now in 1940? Pretty high, right? Pretty high. Okay. And that's kind of why they viewed him as such a hero. Right? They viewed him as a god because he really accomplished everything he set out to do and told the people of what he would do. And then Marshal Patton, what do we got here? Who's Marshal Patton? Who is that? Kiara, what do you got for this one? Okay, all right. So this is pretty much the person that uh, gave the surrender of France. Right? He comes on the radio and tells the French people, hey, we lost. We have to give up. We have to uh, sign the surrender to Germany. It's unfortunate. Okay, they're our enemy. They're our rival. But we just can't compete. We have to give up. Okay, we have to surrender. So he was like their leader that surrendered to, uh, well, France's leader that surrendered to, to Germany. All right, is there any questions on that? You guys good with that? Here's some pictures real quick. I want to show you that before we 
leave off here and I'll show you the video. Some of these pictures. <clears throat> All right, here's the rail car that they signed it in. So this is a 1918. This is a 1918 at the end of World War One. So when we all know the Allied powers beat Germany, you know, the end of the German Empire. Okay, that's it in 1918, the picture of the sign. All right, and then uh, let's find it here. Okay, here's Hitler kind of dancing in, in joy. It's like, oh, look what we did here. Kind of jumping up and down and having a great time after he uh, took over France. And look at him. What is he doing? It's like that commercial, the cloggers. We've got a clogging problem here. Oh, he's good. Uh, where's another picture? Kind of. Well, anyway, here's where they signed it. <clears throat> here's where they signed it. You can see the German soldiers here in the background, generals having Patton sign this, this armistice, sign this uh, surrender. And uh, again, they did it in the rail card to really show spite towards France. Crazy stuff there. Crazy stuff. And then Hitler, to really rub it in, guess where he goes next to take a picture? Huh? Ooh, how do you know that? Good work. Yeah, so then he takes a picture in front of the Eiffel Tower. He's not smiling or anything. He's just kind of like, oh, yeah, look what I did here. No problem. No problem. Dust off the shoulders here. No, no big deal. So he takes a picture in front of the Eiffel Tower. We all know that as their symbol of freedom in France. And that's taken away just within a matter of 35 days, not even a month. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? So that's like someone, I don't know, the United States taking over. They, they go right in front of the Statue of Liberty or something like that. Or right in Washington, D.C. and take a picture right in front of the White House. It's pretty crazy. All right. But, again, he was a man with a plan. He told the people of Germany what he was going to do when he came into power. Did he accomplish it? Yeah, a little bit more overboard, but uh, that's why the people of Germany viewed him such in a high standing. All right, so video, make sure you guys get that reading done for tomorrow.